Hi there, my name is Maria Takalanda and I'm an Associate Professor in Writing and Literature at Deakin University in Victoria, Australia. I am delighted to be with you today to be giving this presentation on contemporary women's speculative fiction in Australia. Uh, but before I begin, I would like to thank Lucas and Bettina for inviting me to give this lecture. It's such a treat to be given an excuse to talk about a subject I'm so passionate about. I would also like to acknowledge uh, the traditional First Nations owners of the land from which I'm speaking to you today, and those peoples are the Wadawurrung. For tens of thousands of years, the First Nations peoples of this country lived here sustainably, according to their cultural and environmental laws, but within a couple of hundred years of colonialism and the spread of capitalism and industrialization and exploitative relations with the earth, this country now finds itself at great risk, like the rest of the world. I'll be touching further on this idea of risk today, but I'll also be touching on various First Nations writers, as they're some of the key writers in Australia when it comes to what we might broadly call speculative fiction a handy umbrella term under which we can find other perhaps more clearly defined genres that traffic in the enigmatically not real, such as fantasy, science fiction, the ghost story, dystopia and magical realism, the last of which happens to be my particular area of expertise. I have published a book and numerous scholarly articles and book chapters on Australian and international magical realist fiction and if you'd like to know more about those publications or more about me, please do visit my website. However, despite having expertise in magical realism, I do like this term speculative fiction. And the first reason I like it is because it suggests a strong connection with ideas. The second reason is because as in the world of finance, the speculation in speculative fiction is related to risk. There is usually a lot at stake in the imaginary worlds of speculative literature. That's certainly the case when it comes to the Australian women's speculative texts I will discuss today, which are Melinda Bobus's Fish Hair Woman, Alexis Wright's The Swan Book, Catherine Heyman's Storm and Grace, and Evie Wilde's The Bass Rock. All four of these speculative novels engage with ideas that relate to contemporary environments of risk. The expression of histories of trauma and oppression, the persistence of the earth beyond climate change as well as the lives of First Nations peoples, and the lives of women jeopardised by gendered violence. So having gone through these preliminaries, let's begin the lecture proper. Now, my 12-year-old son would hate this slide because he's not a particular fan of math, but I hope it's not too off-putting for you. These equations are useful because they show how I want to define speculative fiction for the purposes of this lecture today. So I'm not going to get involved in debating definitions of speculative fiction via scholarly sources and such. I'm just going to define speculative fiction in terms of these three criteria, in terms of these three meanings which are inherent in the word speculation itself. The not real, ideas and risk. I'll add a fourth term soon, enigma, but let's not get ahead of ourselves just right now. So this definition, uh, which we have on this slide, as you'll see, leads me to be able to draw another connection, which is between speculative fiction and allegory as a form similarly defined by the not real of being a set in a space that is too abstract or fantastical to be reality but that nevertheless seems to be interested in embodying ideas that suggest a certain real-world relevance or urgency. 
I'm going to use the next couple of slides to talk in more detail about allegory, but let's begin by remembering that speculative fiction and allegory often go together. Think of all the classic texts that merge speculative fiction, often in the form of dystopia and allegory, from Jonathan Swift Gulliver's Travels, published back in 1726, to George Orwell's 1984, to Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, to the recent Netflix phenomenon of The Squid Game. Not all speculative fiction would be categorised as allegory, or at least not immediately or obviously, but the type of speculative fiction I am interested in today is allegorical, which is to say that it plays out its not real scenarios and ideas in risky and interesting ways that invite worldly parallels and engagements. In fact, the type of speculative fiction I am addressing today must be read allegorically or else we run the risk of condemning it to fantasy. Now, condemn is a harsh word. Don't get me wrong. Fantasy is great. But reading speculative fiction as allegory is different to reading it as fantasy. Generally speaking, with fantasy, we read the text at a literal level. So Harry Potter, for instance, is a wizard who goes to wizard school. But with allegory, we read the text at a figurative level, which is to say we read it in ways that are attentive to the hidden meaning of the text, to its worldly relevance, to the thought experiment that's taking place, to the ideas and a level of risk. Already I need to qualify that fantasy and allegory can be present in the same text. C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe is famously a fantasy novel and an allegory promoting Christian values. However, I would agree with the scholar Lynette Hunter that generally speaking, fantasy can be separated from allegory. As Hunter puts it, fantasy's entire rhetoric aims towards preventing the reader from deeper reading. Fantasy promotes the idea of getting lost in an imaginative landscape separate from our real world. Thus, allegory is more than fantasy, as suggested by my greater than symbol in the last equation on this PowerPoint slide. And yet allegory is always at risk of being read literally, which is to say of being reduced to fantasy. So you might think of the children's version of Gulliver's Travels or Mr. Beast's YouTube reenactment of the Squid Game, which empties that TV drama of its allegorical critique of late capitalism as a brutal gamble played out for the benefit of the privileged few. In Mr. Beast's literal-minded version, it's simply a bit of fun about playing games for cash prizes. And so to be sensitive to allegory, to be sensitive to the ideas and risks of speculative texts when interpreting their not real qualities is of utmost importance, certainly for the novels I'll be discussing today. So let's move on to talking a little bit more about allegory with the help of a couple of PowerPoint slides. Then we'll be able to look at some examples of Australian women's speculative fiction that require allegorical readings. Okay, let's call this the theory part of my lecture, though don't let that be off-putting. I'll try to keep things simple and let the fascinating nature of allegory speak for itself. I'll give you a little bit of time to cognitively digest this slide, but in particular the famous duck-rabbit illusion I have used on this slide because I need you to be able to see uh, both of the images that are implicit there before we can proceed. If you need a bit of help, and I remember I did the first time I saw it, uh, the ears of the rabbit uh, are also the beak of a duck. <laughs> 
or vice versa, depending on which way you look at it. Now, the reason I need you to see the doubleness of this image is because it speaks to the doubleness of allegory in important ways. I hope to elucidate for you now. So to begin with, allegory is both ancient and modern, as the first point on the slide suggests. Though it's fair to say that if speculative fiction has a reputation of being modern, allegory has a reputation for being old, and it is old. Allegory is as old as the fable, the kind of story, usually an animal story, designed to teach you a moral lesson in disguise. The first known example of such allegory is Aesop's Fables, which emerged in ancient Greece in about 600 BCE. However, you can already see that allegory is from the beginning bound up with speculative fiction. Allegory was also written about by ancient scholars. The Roman rhetorician Quintilian spoke about it in 95 CE. Allegory is perhaps best known, though, for its medieval flourishing, for example, in the Christian allegories of Dante's The Divine Comedy, published in 1472, or John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. Allegory is said to have fallen out of favour, in fact, in modernity, when the world began to seem less mysterious and more self-evident, thanks to the so-called Enlightenment, but the allegorical tendency remained very much alive and well. Even in the great Victorian era realist texts, we find allegory at work. Consider, for example, Charles Dickens's novels, which make use of allegorical personification or characters who personify certain vices or virtues, such as Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. We might also have to say that allegory has made something of a resurgence in modernist and postmodernist literature. Consider the works of Franz Kafka or Thomas Pynchon's postmodern classic, The Crying of Lot 49. Among more recent, among more recent fiction, we could look at novels such as Jam Kutzia's Waiting for the Barbarians, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, Ben Okri's The Famished Road, Jan Martel's Life of Pi, there are countless examples, with most of them also being classifiable as speculative fiction. In fact, allegory is so prevalent that we really must conclude that it has an intimate connection not only with speculative fiction, but with literature more generally. In fact, we might say, as Northrop Fry did, in his seminal text for the Discipline of Literary Studies, The Anatomy of Criticism, published 1957, that the way we read literature is fundamentally allegorical. We read the literal story on the page, but we also read beyond the literal. We read the story for hidden meanings. We want to get to the heart of a book's secrets. Not for nothing, then, does the scholar Curtis Grunler trace the origins of literary studies to medieval Christian reading practices, for which, as he writes, the cognitive goal is contemplation of what exceeds immediate comprehension. He also sees in this medieval history of reading an explanation for the contemporary importance of allegory to literature. To say that all literature can be read allegorically, though, isn't exactly helpful uh, when it comes to defining allegory. And to say that literature can be read allegorically is different from claiming that all literature is written allegorically. Now, the scholar Gary Johnson suggests a way out of this quandary, showing us that we can define allegory on a continuum, ranging from strong allegory to weak allegory, or as a continuum stretching from the most obviously allegorical to the most determinedly mimetic, rather than trying to fix a clear line of demarcation between the two. We will see today that our texts for discussion range from what Johnson calls strong to weak allegory. And I think it's worth noting at this point that we can also regard speculative fiction which is so often allegorical, as we have observed, 
as a continuum as well. Indeed, my selection of speculative texts for discussion also range from strong to weak, if we take the not real as the most important characteristic of the category. This idea of a continuum, uh, which is the third point on this slide, um, resonates with the continuous duck rabbit image also on the slide, which I'd like to draw your attention to now again, because it will lead us to the final point about allegory I want to make, which is that allegory is neither one thing, the literal story, nor the other, the hidden meaning. It is both simultaneously. And this is important to understanding allegory because this is the source of what I will call the form's enigma. Now, this sense of the enigmatic can also be tied to the form's doubleness. The dark rabbit image is an enigma because of its doubleness, because of its shiftiness. In the same way that allegory can be considered enigmatic because of its doubleness, the way in which the literal story signals that it is hiding or haunted by another story. Let's move on to our next slide. So we'll spend a little bit more time thinking about this thing called enigma. By now defining allegory in terms of this additional property called enigma, I may seem to be harking back to a mystical tradition of allegory according to which allegory was thought to reveal through riddling concealment a sacred moral or cosmic order beyond the human and beyond history. As Jason Crawford argues, this is perhaps most apparent in the Christian allegories of medieval tradition, which are themselves consistent with a Christian worldview, according to which God and his mysteries are imminent in the material cosmos and to be sought or quested after by those who understand that the riches of life's meaning lie hidden. Thus, in mystical thinking, as well as in allegorical thinking, truth is understood as existing beyond the literal or visible. Meaning, in other words, is fundamentally enigmatic. However, I don't think there's anything particularly mystical about understanding truth as somehow beyond us. Psychoanalysis understands truth as beyond our grasp as do the post-structuralists who argue that truth always lies beyond language. I'm actually more interested in Frederick Jamison's historical materialist or Marxist take on enigma as articulated in his study of allegory, Allegory and Ideology, published 2019. Jamison regards the enigma of contemporary allegory as bound up with the invisible machinations of neo-capitalism. He writes that allegories represent the intricate and unimaginable networks of finance, capital or of data systems, unknowable only in the sense that they are so far unrepresentable. Now, I don't happen to agree that every contemporary allegory can be uniformly read in terms of the enigmas of capitalist systems, as we will see the contemporary allegories by Australian women I'm about to discuss are striving to represent enigmatic truths relevant to the specific socio-historical circumstances of which they write. However, what Jameson reminds us is that the enigma of contemporary allegory is less about some otherworldly meaning than about a worldly truth that is difficult or risky to represent, but that, that must be nevertheless urgently given our attention. Allegory for Jameson emerges in our culture, and this is a terrific quote that I'll uh, feature on a later slide, but, but let me just read it now. So he argues that allegory emerges in our culture when beneath this or that seemingly stable or unified reality 
the tectonic plates of deeper, contradictory levels of the real shift and grate ominously and demand a representation or at least an acknowledgement that they are unable to find in the shame or illusory surfaces of existential or social life. It's a terrific quote. Quite a dense one too, I'm aware, but we will see it presented on a later slide, so bear with me. All I want to say at this moment is that what I like about the quote is how it plays with ideas of the real and the not real in a way that resonates powerfully not only for allegory but also speculative fiction as twin modes of imagining interested in the relationship between the real and the not real. So Jameson is speaking of contemporary allegory, but even traditional allegory, as Crawford reminds us, has never been able to escape the fact that it is, as he writes, a discourse that must unfold in time, which is to say that allegory, any text, can never escape its history. And the close and urgent connection with a particular time and place is probably why allegory is often opaque to us when we look back at earlier examples. If Gulliver's Travels could become an adventure fantasy film in our day and age, it's only because its allegorical meaning as a satire of the royal court of George I in 18th century England was no longer apparent. What this means, though, is that allegory is always very much about the time and place in which it is produced, even as it points to the enigmatic nature of its message through the abstracted or speculative nature of its storytelling. And it's the sense of the enigmatic behind the literal. It's that doubleness, that mysterious doubleness of allegory that gets our attention, that tells us the story has something secret and important to say. It's that sense of enigma that accounts for how you feel when you read Kafka or Beckett or one of Kutzea's allegories. There's a sense of uncertainty, perhaps a sense of discomfort of something uncanny, but there's also a sense of intrigue. And so as the so-called affective turn in literary studies has shown us, we should never discount how we feel because feeling is a part of knowledge, feeling is a part of truth, certainly part of the enigma of truth, because after all, how the body knows is beyond articulation. My main point, though, is that how we feel in the presence of allegory, which is bound up with being in the presence of enigma, is integral to our engagement with allegory. So my idea of defining allegory, partly in terms of its enigmatic affect, uh, comes not from any critic in affect studies or even in allegory studies, and I can't take, uh, I, I can't take um, responsibility uh, for, for how I've defined it, um, because I owe so much to Linda Hutchin and her definition of irony. In fact, it was Hutchins' definition of irony that led me to the duck illusion rabbit featured in the earlier slide. She uses that image to illustrate irony, the doubleness of irony, in her book, Irony's Edge, The Theory and Politics of Irony. Now, irony and allegory do similar figurative work in that both suggest a meaning beyond the literal. Claire Colebrook, in her study of irony, makes the comparison saying that allegory and irony are both a means for saying one thing and meaning another. Maureen Quilligan, however, in her study of allegory, draws a distinction between irony and allegory, arguing that allegory sends the reader somewhere, irony leaves him or her hanging with nowhere to go. Hutchin uses that feeling, that sense of hanging with nowhere to go, as part of her definition of irony, which creates a sense of uncertainty or discomfort about meaning that leads Hutchin to define irony in terms of its affective charge, which she calls its edge. 
When it comes to allegory, as Quilligan also suggests, we're faced with quite a different affective charge, which in Quilligan's words sends us somewhere, it gets us making connections. That feeling which sends us somewhere on a search for meaning perhaps is what I have called the enigmatic. Now to refer to one of the quotes on the slide here, I think Jerry, Jeremy Tambling in the second um, block there on the PowerPoint slide encapsulates that really nicely. So he's talking about how allegory holds us in thrall um, and he writes, to be held by the power of allegory is to be caught by the question, is the reader or viewer captivated and controlled by what is merely a play of masks? Or is there something else other speaking differently from the text? And if so, how can that be heard? As the scholar Angus Fletcher suggests in the final quote on the slide, it is that sense of the enigmatic, enigmatic that defines but also fulfills allegory, priming us and motivating us to engage in interpretation beyond the literal. Through enigma, allegory demands that we prepare to read the text differently, beyond the literal, attuned to the possibility of a different and deeper meaning. <clears throat> Given allegory's long history then from Aesop's fables through to the text we'll discuss very shortly, I think we have to conclude that allegory has proven an effective form of engaging readers and listeners with urgent ideas and warnings. For Grunler, that's because allegory invites thought rather than pushing dogma. Allegory is thought-provoking rather than didactic. Of course, we could say the same of speculative fiction more generally, which we might also consider not only an allegorical form, but an enigmatic one. So here's Grunler on a slide that we're going to finish this theory section of the lecture with before we move on to our case studies or our analysis of texts. So Grunler writes there, you can read the quote along with me, that enigmatic forms engage readers in a process of interpretation that could lead to what we might call free, non-coerced persuasion as opposed to, say, indoctrination. They do so most basically by making interpretation into a game. Now that's a quote my 12 year old son would like. He's a big fan of video games or, or games of any sort. And let's admit that the appeal of speculative fiction and allegory is their game-like nature. They're elements of the not real. Uh, they're engaging experiments with ideas. The sense of risk that comes with playing. The sense of an enigmatic truth waiting there at the end for us to reach. There's no shame in comparing reading and particularly the reading of enigmatic forms of literature such as speculative fiction and allegory to game play. No shame at all. I think we should embrace that. Now let's move on to read some speculative fiction allegories in the engaged ways they demand. So this third and final part of the lecture will be made up of discussions of the four texts I mentioned at the very very beginning. And if you've forgotten though that those, that's perfectly fine because I'll obviously flag those again here. So the first speculative and allegorical novel we're going to look at is Fish Hair Woman by Melinda Bobus, published in 2012. Melinda is a Filipina Australian author and you can see the book cover there on the slide but you can also see the Jamison quote that I read earlier and promised to display. There it is. I'm not quite ready to discuss it yet though. What I want to say in the final part of this lecture, uh, 
as a kind of preliminary statement, I suppose, is that all four of the speculative and allegorical novels I'm going to analyse are very different, which is to say that they exist in different places on the allegorical fiction and speculative fiction spectrums. When it comes to Fish Hair Woman, this text might be placed somewhere in the middle as its common categorization as magical realist fiction suggests. Now, magical realism has something of a problematic reputation, let's say, which I need to quickly address because it relates to the two main problems we also see with readings of allegory. Magical realism is either read as fantasy, perhaps most often in the marketplace, where critics have observed that it caters to the exoticist fantasies of a Western readership who want to um, have adventures in magical faraway places. A similar urge is perhaps what has allowed Gulliver's Travels to become an adventure fantasy for contemporary audiences. But magical realism has also been presented as a kind of third world realism, as a type of fiction that draws on myths and faith systems and, and cultural beliefs that are real to those authors who are writing, or at least to the peoples being represented in their writing. Now, this is an idea that has been challenged partly on the basis that magical realist writers are typically third world cosmopolitans, to borrow the words of the post-colonial critic Timothy Brennan, but also because magical realism is not an ethnographic or anthropological artefact or object, but a form of self-conscious and transnational literature. Magical realism is, is a genre, is a literary genre. But just as with allegory, if we read magical realism as either fantastical or as real, we miss the connection between those two things that magical realism is attempting to make. It's of utmost importance to what is happening in the novels, as we'll see as we engage in this brief reading of Melinda Bobus's magical realist text. Most of Fish Hair Woman is presented as an epistolary narrative, which is to say it is presented in the form of a letter. That letter is a love letter written by a Filipina woman named Estrella to an Australian journalist, Tony McIntyre, who has gone missing in the Philippines where he went to report on the US-supported war against communist insurgents. These so-called insurgents were actually local men and women desperately seeking to maintain ownership of their little plot of land and their ability to maintain a livelihood uh, from local oligarchs or government officials. Now, this war is a real historical event which took place between 1987 and 1989 and which is known as the Total War or Operation Fishnet Trap. While this might so far sound like a historical novel rather than a speculative one, one of the things Estrella's, Estrella narrates to Tony and to us as her readers is how she uses her supernaturally long hair to fish her village's river for the desparaceros or those who have been disappeared in the war. So Estrella's magical hair keeps growing as she fishes out the bodies in direct correlation with the victims that she uncovers in the river and the bodily grief she feels. Thus the novel sets into play this thing called Enigma. There's something going on here that requires our attention, our interpretation, our engagement. In fact, Bobus makes sure that we don't succumb to exoticist fantasy when we're reading her novel. She has Estrella reflect on how her story reads like a, quote, heroes and villains brewing together a coffee and world vision ad. And ultimately we learn that Estrella is a drug addict and a liar. 
The ground of the narrative keeps shifting, keeps us in the realm of enigma and uncertainty, keeps us investigating like the Western journalist to whom Estrella is supposedly writing. And it becomes clear that the novel's material interest lies in exposing the land appropriation and murders that were covered up during and in the aftermath of the total war, what the novel calls the too many bodies in the river, too many stories that were hushed. Chapters of Estrella's narrative are interwoven with newspaper reports and even lists of the names of the dead, and it all begins to make sense. This speculative novel is allegorising its own attempt through narrative to fish out a truth that has been drowned out of history. And now's the time to bring in the Jamison quote about allegory, which is also pertinent to the related form of speculative fiction, which so often sets fantasy and reality in interplay to tease out how our vision of the real is so often fantastical. So here it is, allegory emerges in our culture when beneath this or that seemingly stable or unified reality, the tectonic plates of deeper contradictory levels of the real shift and grate ominously and demand a representation, or at least an acknowledgement that they are unable to find in the sheen or illusory surfaces of existential or social life. Certainly the task set for us by Bobus's speculative and allegorical novel is to look deeper. It is to look beyond the official story of what is real. And that also happens to be the case with the other novels I want to discuss. The next of these being Alexis Wright's The Swan Book. So the Swan Book belongs more clearly in the category of speculative fiction and allegory than Bobus's novel. This is partly because it's a dystopian novel, which uses the science fiction convention of a futuristic setting, but also because it flags the allegorical nature of its characters through conspicuous and even absurd sounding names, as we will very shortly see. Now, this novel by the Wanyi woman, Alexis Wright, is part of a wider flourishing in speculative fiction by Australian First Nations writers. Uh, they include Claire Coleman, Melissa Lukashenko, Kim Scott, Sam Watson and others. In fact, in Australia, it's fair to say that First Nations writers dominate the scene when it comes to speculative fiction. Now that alone signals to us how speculative fiction might allow for difficult, risky, urgent or subversive truths to be unearthed from beneath what Jamison describes as the official or conventional surface of reality. When it comes to the Swan Book, we have a novel that clearly signals its status as speculative fiction and allegory, as well as its interest in challenging colonialist visions of Australia's history and future. So the novel is set exactly three centuries after the colonial invasion of Australia in 1788. Climate change has wreaked havoc on ecosystems and climate refugees from all over the world have been confined alongside First Nations people on the shores of a desert swamp. The military uses the place as a dump for unwanted international asylum seekers or boat people. The military has also dumped the detritus of previous military operations there, including ships. The rusting hulks of these ships with their abandoned steel planks of timber, brass lanterns and fittings, and ghost sailors are strangely, conspicuously, one might say, old-fashioned 
Now, if you're in Australia or know anything about Australia, you'll immediately recognise that this novel is gesturing towards elements of Australian reality in its speculative story making. In fact, it's making a quite explicit satirical comment through allegory. Australia's recent hostile policies towards asylum seekers are quite well known. These policies have at times been justified by the Australian government uh, as protecting its citizens from potential terrorists. The harshest punishments are directed towards those desperate refugees who arrive by boat, the so-called boat people, who have been imprisoned in offshore detention centres. Now, it's also the case that the old-fashioned ships Wright describes evoke the first fleet of the British colonisers. The implication is clear from a First Nations perspective, white Australians are the original unwanted boat people arriving on this country's shores and terrorising First Nations Australians more surely than any imagined terrorists. In fact, the novel is explicit about the nature of the ships and its satirical message. The rotting boats had belonged to an army of textbook terrorists who had invaded other countries. Now, to find such explicit statements or instructions regarding how to read the allegorical elements of speculative texts is not unusual. After all, we are talking about ideas or, or a message that need to urgently be conveyed. It's not desirable for, for a writer necessarily to take a risk with their message being misread or, or, or unheard. So what we see is a liberal use of satire in this novel's deployment of allegory, and this makes the meaning of that allegory more explicit. But the central figure of Wright's novel, Oblivia Etheline, is a deeply traumatised and silent First Nations girl, and she might be viewed as the central enigma of the Swan Book. Oblivia Etheline's absurd, conspicuously absurd and allegorical name signals her allegorical function. Her petrochemical surname highlights the parallel between the destruction of her people and the destruction of her land. But her first name also draws attention to forgetting Oblivia. The forgetting by Oblivia of her First Nations identity, but also the forgetting by white Australia of the trauma inflicted on Australia's First Nations people. When it comes to Oblivia's forgetting of her own identity, the novel makes it clear that it is no accident, given that Oblivia's name was given to her by a European woman who discovers and adopts the traumatised child. That woman has another allegorically loaded name, Belladonna of the Champions. Named after a poisonous plant, Belladonna proves duly destructive. Belladonna takes Oblivia to live with her in the wreck of one of the army ships, where the woman's aim in life was to get the girl to act normal, behave and sit up straight at the table and use a knife and fork properly, learn table manners, talk nicely, walk as a butterfly flies, dress like a normal person, learn something marvellous on a daily basis and show some resilience. Belladonna also cultivates Oblivia's forgetfulness when it comes to her cultural heritage, tranquilizing her, the novel suggests, with the ether of European stories about white swans. Leader in the Swan, Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tale, Wagner's Lohengrin, and Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake. As the novel's omniscient narrator tells us, when it comes to Oblivia's worldview, it was a foreigner's dreaming she had. So, what we see is how Belladonna, to her mind, not only heroically discovers Oblivia, just as white Australians, are said to have discovered this continent, but also sets about giving her a colonial identity in a way that resonates with the treatment 
of First Nations people throughout Australia's colonial history. Indeed, Oblivia invites allegorical parallels with the so-called stolen generation of First Nations children who were removed from their parents in the 20th century under the pretext of improving their lives. Though the agenda, it has become clear, was always to eliminate First Nations identity. Now, it's made clear in the novel that Oblivia needs to regain control of her own identity, but the novel suggests just how difficult it might be to recover from the personal, cultural, political and environmental de devastation wreaked by colonialism on First Nations people. Given the ways in which First Nations identity is tied to country, as First Nations people refer to their land, how is the reclamation of identity to be possible in a ruined environment? The conclusion to the novel leaves us with a vision of Oblivia on the shores of the swamp, nursing a black swan called Stranger. Now, I can't think of a more powerful vision of otherness and sovereignty. For me, the enigmatic swan called Stranger symbolizes the right of every person not to be known, the right of every one of us to have a truth beyond the knowing of anyone else. This is a particularly powerful message given that First Nations Australians have historically been the most written about people in the world. Here, Wright shelters her protagonist behind Enigma, but she also uses Enigma to challenge her reader's complacency to unsettle what we think we know. Of course, this is what speculative fiction and allegory, broadly speaking, do through their representation of things that don't immediately make sense, through their generation of the affect of enigma. And it's at this point that I'd like to refer you to the quote on the slide. It's from Eleanor Cook's study called Enigma and Riddles in Literature. She writes, thinking through enigma means thinking in a different way, expanding the brain, enlarging its energies. I like that reference to energy because I think speculative fiction allegories require us to respond to them with intellectual energy, a cognitive energy as Cook suggests, but one that first comes from being moved to engage with the texts through the power of enigma. And here we come to the final two novels for discussion. So at the, at the beginning of my comments on the Swan Book, I mentioned a First Nations renaissance of speculative fiction writing in Australia. But there's also something going on with women, as the title of my lecture suggests. Melinda Bobus and Alexis Wright are among a host of women writers in this country practicing allegorical speculative fiction. But there are many others, including Evie Wilde and Catherine Heyman, in whose work we find an enigmatic addressing of ideas associated with misogyny and gender-based violence. Indeed, gender issues are already germane to Melinda Bobus's Fish Hair Woman and Alexis Wright's The Swan Book, both of which explore traumas experienced by women, albeit in the specific contexts of civil war and colonialism. What's interesting to me about the two novels on your screen, Evie Wilde's The Bass Rock and Catherine Heyman's Storm and Grace, is their attempt to grapple with misogyny as a more universal problem. And the fundamental way they both do this is by mobilizing the enigmatic enigmatic figure of the ghost. <laughs> 
Now, the ghost is an interesting staple of speculative fiction, most common in fantasy, magical realism, and the Gothic. And it's interesting because it is a speculative figure with such a long and universal history. As such, it already speaks of the long and universal nature of the problem of gendered violence. I'll speak briefly about Evie Wilde's The Bass Rock first. Um, in the case of, of this novel, the novel's interest in a history of misogyny and violence against women, women is also highlighted by the three-part narrative, which takes place in three different time periods. One of those time periods is medieval, portraying the persecution of women deemed witches. But there is also the important Victorian setting of the haunted manor or, or castle, which appears in the post-war and contemporary time periods covered in the book. However, all of those time periods overlap through the haunting presences of murdered women. In the contemporary section of the novel, a character called Maggie, who notably identifies as a witch, carries a map of murdered women. Their murders announced by the police as isolated incidents. Maggie, though, finds a pattern, saying of the victim and the perpetrator, she was a woman and he is a man. For Maggie, what she refers to as a vast and infinite amnesia has been at work for centuries, perhaps millennia, allowing us to overlook this systematic violence towards women. However, as Maggie asks, what if all the women that have been killed by men through history were visible to us all at once? This speech is key to unlocking the allegorical potential of the enigmatic ghosts in the novel because those ghosts from the persecuted medieval girl through to the ghost knocking about in the Victorian era house make visible those victims of gendered violence. Catherine Heyman's Storm and Grace also makes powerful use of the speculative and allegorical figures of the ghost in a way that similarly traces gendered violence through history. Storm and Grace is the story of a passionate and violent relationship, but it is also a critique of what one of the characters describes as all that Fifty Shades shit referring to the sadomasochistic eroticism of the cultural phenomenon Fifty Shades of Grey, which began its life as fan fiction for that other cultural classic of sadomasochistic eroticism, the Twilight Vampire Saga. What's interesting about Heyman's novel is how allegory is clearly at work even in the ostensibly realist storyline. So the young, naive protagonist, Grace Kane, is seduced by the international free-diving legend Storm Hisray, who has a history of violence towards women. Storm promptly whisks Grace away to an island location where he instructs her in the dangerous art of free-diving, which becomes an allegory for their dangerous relationship. Repeating time-worn gender stereotypes, Storm insists that Grace is the siren and goddess who has seduced him. But Storm, as his conspicuously allegorical name suggests, is very much the seduc seductive legend or temptress of this romance. The novel engages with mythological female characters, but they are not sirens. They're victims of male violence, as well as being agents of vengeance. The Inuit figure Sedna, for example, is a key female mythological figure in Heyman's novel. She is a daughter helplessly given away by her father in marriage to a bird spirit who imprisons her on his island. Sedna ends up dead 
at the bottom of the sea, but time transforms her into a powerful and angry goddess of the deep. Another key mythological reference is to Euripides' ancient Greek tragedy Medea, from which the novel quotes a couple of lines and borrows the idea of a chorus of narrators. And this chorus, to me, uh, is, is the most obviously speculative or fantastical element of the novel, but it's also the most enigmatic and fascinating, carrying, essentially, the meaning, the allegorical meaning of the novel. Just as a bit of a refresher, the chorus in Greek theatre was akin to the ancient device of omniscient narration. So the chorus introduced and commented on the action of a play and provided a way for the playwright to speak directly to and even instruct the audience in how to understand what was happening. Heyman uses the narrative device of the chorus in a very similar way, a way that also happens to be consistent with classical allegory, which is also known for providing instructions regarding how the text is to be read. The chorus of women in Heyman's novel frame the narrative to offer context or guidance to the reader. They also gradually reveal themselves as the victims of male violence. They have been, quote, thrown from balconies, held underwater, felt pillows shoved against our faces. These women not only bear witness to Grace's experience, narrating Grace's story, but they also attempt to warn her through various ghostly apparitions, making their breath appear on a window pane, for instance, or forming shapes in the ocean. They also act to caution the reader who is not allowed to surrender to an unreflective experience of this supposed love story. By the end, these contemporary ghosts merge with the mythological figures of ancient tradition, enacting vengeance on Storm, who has been from the beginning as signalled by his name, a timeless and universal archetype for male passion or violence. What's important to note though, is that while these speculative novels can be resolved allegorically at some level, in as much as we are able to say what they are about with reference to the real world, they nevertheless uphold the enigmatic nature or origins of the male violence they condemn. They do this through speculative figures such as ghosts or mythological archetypes, or by setting into play various other mysterious or enigmatic symbols such as the bass rock of the title of Wilde's book. In this they share with the other novels we have examined today, namely Melinda Bobus's Fish Hair Woman and Alexis Wright's The Swan Book, a common attachment to enigma as an essential quality of speculative fiction and allegory, but also as an essential quality of the truth of human nature. Now this slide signals the end of my lecture, um, but as I make my concluding remarks, uh, please feel free to follow up on any of these uh, works that you see before you, um, from which I have derived what I think are some quite interesting ideas and material for my presentation today. I'd also like to throw in a verbal, if not a visual, reminder of our duck-rabbit enigmatic image, which we studied earlier because of the ways in which it exemplifies and summarises the doubleness of speculative fiction and allegory as twin forms of imaginative literature, in which the not real and the real exist in synergistic relation to create a feeling of enigma that inspires us to engage with these novels with deeper than usual attention. We know that there are ideas there 
waiting for us to find them. We know that those ideas are invested in risk in circumstances of great importance to us today. That sense of the enigmatic makes the text into an object of fascination of the kind I imagine has inspired you to listen to this lecture. The enigmatic nature of speculative texts also makes reading something of a game as we search for the allegorical or worldly meaning that's hiding beside the facade of the literal and fantastical. If I have a final message, it's for us to keep playing this urgent game of reading and interpreting and thinking and feeling the mystery of meaning. Anyway, I think that's well and truly going to be it for me. So thank you for your patience and thank you for listening.